Hello friends, in this video we continue with the lecture on the approach to obstructive jaundice and we in the previous lecture we have already discussed about the what are the histories to be taken and what are the differential diagnosis and how to arrive at a differential diagnosis, how to arrive at a provisional diagnosis based on history and examination. Now we will look into the investigations, how to investigate and what are the treatment algorithms for a patient with obstructive jaundice. So if you move ahead what the first investigation to be done for a patient with obstructive jaundice is liver function test. Now the liver function test is the first and the most useful investigation to establish the diagnosis and for this we are going to find a raised alkaline phosphatase which is very hallmark of obstructive jaundice. Also we will be looking into the total bilirubin as well as the direct bilirubin should be usually more than the indirect bilirubin. And the third thing, we will be also looking at the albumin level in a patient with obstructive jaundice because these patients, because of the obstruction, the liver synthetic function decreases at with time and the nutrition status and therefore the albumin synthesis decreases. Further, if the obstructive jaundice is due to malignancy, due to chronic dietary restriction, due to, due to chronic anorexia and uh, loss of appetite, the patient might be having low albumin in the plasma. So LFT also reveals albumin level which might be low in some patients. We should also get a PTINR done, which reflects the coagulation profile for this patient because these patients, because of cholestasis, have decreased uh, liver function and the coagulation factors, the vitamin K coagulation factors are decreased and so the uh, prothrombin time or the INR might be deranged. So we have to look into the PTINR as well. Once we have established the diagnosis of obstructive jaundice, the next investigation is an ultrasound of the whole abdomen. Next we go for an ultrasound of the whole abdomen. Now, what are the things we are going to look into the ultrasound of the whole abdomen? If we do an ultrasound, the first thing that we are going to look at is the hepatobiliary tree. In the hepatobiliary tree, we are going to specifically look at the gallbladder. We are going to look at whether there is any gallstone present or not. Because sometimes there might be multiple gallstones which might slip into the CBD and responsible for scolidopolithiasis and osteoarthritis jaundice. Simultaneously, we will be looking at the liver whether there is any hepatomegaly or any metastasis to the liver or any portal lymph nodes enlarged. Also, we will be looking at the extrahepatic and intrahepatic biliary radicals. If only the extrahepatic biliary radical is dilated, we should think about conditions like colidocal cyst. If both extra and intrahepatic biliary radicals are dilated, we should think about phosphatic jaundice. We should think about uh, mechanical obstruction. So extrahepatic uh, biliary radical, we are going to look at the CBD and the diameter of the CBD. Because if the CBD is dilated, it might be due to stone or it might be due to malignancy. We have to find out the diameter of the CBD as well. We have to find out whether the intrahepatic biliary radicals are dilated or not. Apart from this, we are going to look at the pancreas, whether any mass is seen in the pancreas or not. If it mass is seen, then what is the site of the mass? What is the extent of the mass? And whether there are any adjacent lymph nodes which are enlarged. Though ultrasound is not very sensitive for a pancreatic mass, still for screening purpose, ultrasound can be done as a first line investigation. Then we do check for ascites and lymph nodes. So th these are the findings we are going to look for in an ultrasound of the abdomen. Now depending on the ultrasound finding, we have to decide what further investigation we will be looking for. If the ultrasound of the abdomen is suggestive of some stone disease, suppose there is some stone in the gallbladder or multiple calcula in the gallbladder with stone in the bile duct, then the management approach will be different. And if the ultrasound is suggestive of some mass lesion, then the management approach will be different. We are going to look at the individual approach in detail. Now, if the ultrasound is suggestive of some stone in the common bile duct, we will go for an MRCT. This gives a better anatomical delineation of the entire hepatobiliary tree. And uh, we can get an idea of the number of the calculi, the size of the calculi and the exact site of the calculi. So once we have done an MRCP, depending on the finding of the MRCP, we will decide how do we deal with the stones in the CBD? Now suppose if there is a single solitary stone which is less than 2 cm and which is present in the distal part of the CBD and in another situation there are multiple calculi or which there are more than 2 cm size calculi or the calculi is present in the mid or proximal part of the CBD. There are two different situations which can arise in an MRCP finding. So if the MRCP is suggestive of a single less than 2 cm distal CBD calculus, we can go in these patients straightforward with an ERCP. We will go for an ERCP and we will consider stone extraction via the ERCP. 
But if there are multiple stone, more than two centimeter calculator, if they're high up in the CBD, the, in that case, ERCP is not possible. In that case, we can go for CBD exploration. Well, let us understand this in slight detail. We have done a CBD exploration. Suppose this is the CBD and we have extracted the stones from the CBD. Now, after the stone extraction, there are two options we can do. We can either consider for primary closure over a T-tube. We can place a T-tube from here and we can consider a primary closure over a T-tube. Second, we can go for a biliary enteric anastomosis. We can either put a T-tube in this incision site and close this primarily, or we can bring a loop of bowel over here, either jejunum or duodenum and perform a cholidoco jejunostomy or cholidoco duodenostomy or even we can perform a ruin by cholidoco jejunostomy so these are the different options available if you find a stone in the common bile duct first we go for an mrcp for a better anatomy delineation depending on the mrcp finding we go for ERCP or cbd exploration and after the cbd exploration we can either go for a primary closure with over a T-tube or we can go for a biliary enteric anastomosis. Now, if the ultrasound is suggestive of some mass lesion in the pancreas, next thing that we do is a CT scan because CT scan is very sensitive for detecting the mass and also for staging of the mass. Before we move on to the CT scan, we should be knowing what type of CT scan we do for a patient with pancreatic mass. The CT scan that is done is a CT whole abdomen. It is done in triple phase. It is done in pancreatic protocol. The entire thing has to be mentioned in the exam that we will consider for a CCT whole abdomen triple phase in pancreatic protocol because the radiologist should be knowing that what you have to look for. Now, what is this triple phase CT scan? The triple phase CT scan means the first phase is the arterial phase. The second is the late arterial or parenchymal phase. And the third one is the portal venous phase. Usually the arterial phase is around 20 seconds when the films are taken after 20 seconds of injection of contrast. Late arterial is around 40 seconds of contrast and portal venous phase is after 40 seconds, which is around 70 seconds of injection of the contrast. So these are the three phases. Definitely before this, we take a pre-contrast or non-contrast film to compare the enhancement later with the contrast films. Now, what is the purpose of this individual phases? The arterial phase can depict tumors which are highly vascular, hypervascular tumors. The hypervascular tumors can be identified in the arterial phase. And the parenchymal phase, the differentiation of the tumor is the maximum. In the portal venous phase, we can identify the venous encasement, whether it is present or not, because that will decide the resectability of the tumor. So in one word, CT scan is used for staging of the mass. Now, depending on the CT scan finding, once we evaluate the CT scan, we can identify that the patient is either having a resectable tumor or a borderline resectable tumor or an unresectable tumor. If you find a resectable tumor, then we can go for Whipple's procedure. For a borderline resectable tumor, we can either go for an upfront surgery or we can go for a near given chemotherapy. This varies from center to center. We can go for an upfront surgery with vascular reconstruction intraoperative or we can go for a near given chemotherapy. So if we go for a near given chemotherapy, what we have to do is we have to get an endoscopic ultrasound guided FNSE on the mass before we can start the chemotherapy. So endoscopic ultrasound guided FNSE is a must before we proceed for a neoadjuvant chemotherapy. After neoadjuvant chemotherapy, we do restaging of the tumor. And after restaging, if there is downstaging of the tumor and amenable to resection, we can go for a Whipple's procedure. So this was the basic investigation. And based on the investigation, how do we approach a patient with obstructive jaundice? But there are a few other points that should be kept in mind while we are dealing with patients with obstructive jaundice. Before we take up any patient for obstructive jaundice, a few preoperative concerns that should be addressed. The first one is the patient of obstructive jaundice are usually dehydrated because of a lot of third space fluid loss. And this dehydration should be corrected with IV fluids. Usually normal saline is given prior to operation so that the dehydration is corrected well before surgery. Second is these patients might have associated coagulopathy due to hepatic dysfunction. And this coagulopathy should be corrected with vitamin K injection for three to five days prior to surgery. Third thing that should be kept in mind is these patients might have nutritional deficiency because the patient might be having anorexia and might not be taking food well before surgery. So the albumin level should be checked and the patient might require parenteral nutrition 
or nutritional buildup before surgery. In patients of periampillary cancer, the patient might bleed and so there might be anemia as well. Besides, in any patient of malignant obstructive jaundice, there might be anemia. So if there is any anemia, that has to be corrected prior to surgery by blood transfusion at least. The last one is very important, that is biliary decompression. If there is persistently elevated bilirubin level, and if the bilirubin level is around 15 or 20, then we should consider for preoperative biliary decompression because biostasis for prolonged time might be a source of sepsis. And this biliary decompression, then should, should be done if the bilirubin level is around 15 or more. We should go for a preoperative biliary decompression and this can be done by ERCP and stenting. Once the bilirubin level starts decreasing, we can prepare the patient for surgery. So these are the different preoperative concerns that should be addressed while dealing with a patient of obstructive jaundice for surgery. So now we know how do we approach a patient of obstructive jaundice, what are the different steps to approach a patient of obstructive jaundice, what are the investigations we do, if we find a stone in ultrasound, what do we do next, if we find a mass in ultrasound, what do we do next. We should also remember at the same time, if we are finding a mass in the ultrasound, there is also a role of CA99 to be done simultaneously. The CA99 has prognostic significance. It's a tumor marker for pancreatic cancer, which has prognostic significance. And uh, regarding the management of gallbladder cancer, we will have a separate video on that. Till then, if you find this video useful, stay tuned to this channel for more upcoming videos. Thank you so much for watching this video.